Grace and peace be with you, my sisters and brothers. It is good to have you with our lectionary Bible study. I am Pastor Ben Lockett, the pastor of Victor United Methodist Church, and I am again joined by my two wonderful friends and colleagues, uh, Pastor Sarah. Say hi, Sarah. Hi. And Pastor Sam. Say hi, Sam. Hello, Sam. There it is. Uh, both gifted, wonderful pastors uh, who are serving in the Virginia Annual Conference uh, and have uh, made this journey along with us this entire time. Uh, it, it's been a wonderful journey so far uh, to continue to, to do our lectionary study uh, in this setting. Uh, but just as a reminder, uh, the lectionary is a text that we use uh, and that many denominations use uh, to accomplish the Bible in roughly three years. Uh, if you stick with all four scriptures uh, that are presented on a lectionary Sunday and finish all of those and stick to that for three years, you'll finish uh, a little over 80% of the entire uh, Bible, which is a good way to get through uh, the vast majority of it. Uh, what we will be using, we'll be using the New Revised Standard Translation, our preferred translation, but we want to encourage you to use whatever translation uh, is most beneficial for you. Uh, and uh, again, we have this on, on recording. Uh, you should see everything coming up on screen. Uh, but we want to encourage you to follow along with us uh, at home. Uh, did I miss any other housekeeping things? No, I just hope that if you're trying to get to the Bible in three years, you should do it more than just on Sunday. There you go. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a way to do it, but probably not uh, the best way to do it. Uh, but it's better than a lot of ways, like not opening your Bible at all. Uh, yes, uh, you know, reading the Bible at least once uh, is better than zero. So uh, we, we give thanks to God for that. With that being Great. said, uh, Sarah, could you lead us in prayer, please? Yeah, let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this time together uh, today, that even over um, distances, we are able to dig into your word and discover new things about you. And we pray that as we uh, read together and pray together and study together today, that uh, you would open our minds to the truth that you want to reveal, that you would be with us uh, wherever we're at, wherever we're watching this from, and, um, and just speak into our lives, Lord, into our situations. May the living word and uh, your presence speak to us today in ways that set us free in ways that uh, draw us closer to you and in ways that help us to grow as people of faith. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Uh, and to go over our scripture, um, we'll have, uh, it should be on screen uh, as, as you watch this. Our first scripture that we'll be talking about uh, is the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. Then we'll be going to Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 21. Then we'll be jumping to Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. And hopefully, God willing, if we have enough time, we'll be sure to, uh, to get to Psalm 105, verses 1 through 6, 23 to 26, and 45. 45C. 45C, yes. Uh, God forbid if we, we read the whole... Heaven forbid you read B. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, we want to encourage you that um, to, to read these scriptures on your own as well, uh, to even if you want to pause this video or uh, to make sure uh, that you go and read those or to follow along as we are reading them. Uh, so with that being said, uh, our dear brother Sam uh, is going to be reading our first scripture, which is the gospel lesson. Amen. And um, just as a brief aside, if you're not familiar with Psalm 105, it is fantastic. You really should take the time to read it. It will take everything we're talking about today and sum it up again, which is super neat. So anyways, let's get to the text. This is the Gospel of Matthew. And today we are reading Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 28 from the New Revised Standard Version. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he said, turned and said to Peter, get away from me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. 
for you are setting your mind on the divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any of you want to follow me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who would save their life will lose it, and those who will lose their lives will save it for my sake. For what will the profit of them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their own life? For the Son of Man has come with his angels in the glory of his Father, that he will repay everyone for what he has done. Truly I tell you, there is some standing here who will not taste death before they have seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, my holy friends, um, I'm going to go down an avenue that most of y'all should know, and I'm sure I can hear my churches groaning already, you know, five days before church, about how this is one of those sections that makes me feel like a broken record, because I talk about it a lot. So I'm going to go talk about that very quickly, and then talk about a really interesting route that I'll probably be taking this Sunday. So that whole thing about um, losing your life so that you may have it in Christ is, or as it says in the New Revised Standard Version, I always think about it in King James, of course, where he tells us, um, for what will it profit a man, or what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? I always think about the King James Version that tells us, you know, what is the value of a life on earth if you forfeit your soul or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. But this whole idea that I try to instill in everybody I know is everything that we have. Our lives, our livelihood, our families, our possessions, all this junk in this office. It's not mine. It's God's. It's always been God's. Everything that we have here today is on lease. And just as quickly as it's been received, it can just as quickly be taken away. That is not what saves you. That is not what will give you new life. That is not what will bring you joy. Now, these things can bring forth joy, but it is not the items themselves. Like I could sit there and play the accordion and probably make myself happy by playing dumb songs. However, that's not where I get joy from because that joy comes transitory, of course, from God. He has given the possession into my life so that I may have joy. So it's important to recognize as disciples that none of this is ours to begin with. So one, don't get so attached to everything that we have. And secondly, be ready to use what we have for the kingdom. Mm. Don't think about it just for ourselves and say, well, I really enjoyed this. Think about it for what we can use it for others. Um, I think about as well about the book of James when I think about this section in this topic, where I think about James should be four, where he's talking about you know, why do you pray and you don't get anything, right? And it's because we have malice in our hearts. We have, we murder one another because we have, we want what they have. We covet what other people have and we won't get it because there is malice in our hearts. So instead of praying for God, I really wish I had that promotion because I want more money. Um, an idea of thinking about that would be, Lord, this promotion would help me do more for the kingdom and thinking about less of ourselves and more of the world. So I say this a lot. <laughs> it's kind of one of my, uh, probably one of my foundational understandings of ministry that none of us is ours. It all belongs to God. So use it for God. Don't keep, keep things to yourself. There's way more cool things you can do, um, especially when you share with others, not just those of the faith, but those who may have never heard the name of Christ. So anyways, that's um, one of my favorite sections to talk about. But what's really fascinating to me is taking the past month of the scriptures that we've had and weaving this narrative that's based on Peter, right? Because if you recall, three weeks ago, Peter what fell out of a boat. He fell into the water because he didn't have enough faith. And Christ, whether you call it rebuking, whether you call it comforting and reassuring, he was told, talked to by Jesus, right? And then the next week, he's trying to push away a Canaanite woman, and Jesus calls this woman a woman of great faith, right? So talk about a verbal diss, right? You already have weak faith. And then this woman who Jesus shouldn't have even been associating with has great faith. So we get to last week. And Peter is, of course, in my mind, one of the most reckless disciples. I love him to death. He is the one that would probably eat hot sauce and dirt if he told him he couldn't. And he is now the pillar of the church, right? His faith has been seen in Christ even through all of his mistakes, even knowing that he's going to go bet wrong. God still loves him and still chose him. <clears throat> and what does Peter do this week? 
messes up again. Immediately after being told he was the perfect one, he was the pillar on which the church would be made, and he looks to himself rather than looking to the kingdom. Because this section is, it, it's weird for us in the 21st century, I feel. It's strange for us to look at this text and say, oh, well, Jesus is talking about how he's going to die, but we knew he was going to die. Mm. But to think about being in that crowd, right? Being with the people that are, he's been with, his disciples, living with him, talking with him, eating with him, sharing meals and conversations, walking through the streets, performing miracles. And to hear him say, I'm going to die. These people that we're talking to are going to take me, arrest me, and they're going to murder me. Mm. And I feel it. Peter would be reasonably upset. I mean, think about if any of us did that same thing today. Now, I, I would say take an extreme grain of salt if you know I stand up in the pulpit and say that I'm about to get arrested and they're going to crucify me, so please start the new kingdom. Please take that with an extreme grain of salt. But to hear the Messiah say this, Peter is upset. And he says, God forbid, never let this thing happen. Mm. And I think sometimes that's kind of how we see our own faith, isn't it? Our own walk with Christ, where Christ tells us we're going to do crazy and ridiculous things. We're going to go and talk to people we would have never associated with in our whole lives. We're going to go and say words that we may have never thought about saying, but Christ is going to lead us in a brand new direction. But how comfortable are we with the Jesus that we know and we love? The, the storybook Jesus, the Sunday school Jesus, mm. the one that makes us just feel safe and complacent. However, I have the unfortunate news of sharing that we do not serve a God of complacency. We have never served a God who simply sits in his laurels and says, you know what, they'll figure it out. Or, you know what, they're good enough. They, they've got it all sorted. They can just sit there on their butts and wait for the rapture to happen. God has always been moving as much as he moves through us. We are called to have that same fervor and movement in other people's lives and in our own lives, in the circles that we make with our friends, our family, our jobs, our communities, we are called to always be moving and seeking and showing the love that was first shown to us. And frankly, as Christ says, we're called to love our neighbors as ourselves. We're called to pick up our crosses and follow him. And that means loving radically, showing mercy, being the children of God that he's called us to be. So that, that's kind of the direction I would be taking this week for this. Because the last part, of course, is um, very interesting as well this idea that the, 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 there are some here that will never taste death before the son of man or before the kingdom of heaven. You know, I should actually read it instead of just trying to paraphrase it. <laughs> Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. And I think we need to remember that because as disciples, as we learned last week with those keys of sin and death or of, of Hades, as he says in that scripture, we know that, we may taste death for a moment, but that's not where we live. These bodies will eventually shut down, but we will not truly die even when our bodies decide to give out on us. We will always be able to go to the Father and be part of this eternal kingdom and not worry about sin and death, but we've already been conquered over it. Well, we have conquered it, I should say, through the blood of Christ Jesus. So what have y'all got? Amen. Sarah, you want to go first? Um, sure. It's never um, a good sign. I... <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Ladies first. I mean, I feel like, Sam, you covered that so well, um, just touching on all of that, uh, the different things I was thinking about. Um, I do always like, I mean, I think it's just a funny passage that we get about Jesus because we don't often get Jesus like chewing out his disciples in such a, like an extreme way uh, where he calls them Satan and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, to me, it shows Jesus passion and um, and the seriousness, I think, of of what it means to follow Jesus and that even though Peter was just saying, you know, oh, what Jesus said, I don't want that to happen. Um, you know, that that even saying that to Jesus was a very serious thing. Um, and how, you know, our lives, we can maybe sometimes think that things are small and not a big deal, but they get us off track. 
Mm. Um, they get us, you know, instead of being aligned with the kingdom and God's will, we start to get aligned with other things or our own will or, you know, somebody else's will or what we think the, the world or the culture is saying. And, um, you know, it doesn't always start with a, one big act or one big change in our lives. Sometimes it's just those small things where we just say, well, that's not what I want, or that's not how I think this should happen, um, and getting off track there, so. You know, that's well, that's well said. Uh, it, it is, Sarah and Sam, you both, you know, said it perfectly that we are uncomfortable with with this type of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. um, we like that kumbaya Jesus, right? Who just like pats us on the head and says like, I love you, like, you know, keep at it. Uh, you know, bad at your little, little disciple. Right, you're like, oh, you're doing so great. Keep on going, right? You're like, um, and you know, it's interesting, right? And, and it's funny because looks at, for all of us, you know, we zero in on this interaction between Peter and Jesus. Um, but for me, what my thought process was that Peter is actually thinking he's doing good, mm -hmm. right? You know, it, it's not that he... It's weird, you know, sometimes the interpretation of what, what Peter wants. And of course, I'm not Peter, so I can't tell you exactly what he was, you know, what he was thinking uh, when he said this. But maybe for Peter, how I've interpreted is, well, Jesus, if you die, it messes up everything. Mm. Right? But if you're here, then you can keep preaching, you can keep healing, you can keep doing everything that, that, that you're doing. Uh, and that's what the world needs. And, and this really brings, for me, the way that I've, I've preached this uh, before is this understanding that even when we think we're doing the right thing or the, or the best thing, it still may not be what the kingdom is calling us to do. Mm. Or, and, and sometimes in churches, we, we struggle with that, don't we? Right? Uh, to say, oh, this is the, the you know, oh, we should do this. Or, or uh, I have often, you know, named it as kind of the copycat syndrome right? Where, you know, one church will be doing this and the, and the church is doing great, right? You know, maybe uh, saw some growth or really just it's a wonderful ministry. And so it comes back to, you know, church number two and church number two is like, oh, that's, we should do the same thing, right? Mm. Um, but if that's not what God is calling your church to do, then you shouldn't do it, right? Uh, and, and of course, now what I'm talking about is, you know, broader structure. I'm not talking about you know, oh, this church started loving people, you know, we shouldn't love people too. Like, that's not what I'm saying. You know, uh, I'm talking about maybe like a food pantry or some other, you know, uh, maybe ministry thing uh, that maybe we don't have the right resources for, or maybe that's just not what God is asking this church to do. Because for Jesus, as he's trying to teach Peter and the rest of those who are listening, it's about the kingdom. It's about the kingdom, right? Not what we want. And, and Peter wanted Jesus to stay because he thought that was the best thing because he loved Jesus, right? I mean, it's not that when Jesus rebukes him, it's not that you, you don't love me. Right? That's not what he's re rebuking him for. He's rebuking him because he's, he's got the wrong direction. I, I, see, I see what you're trying to do, but that's not the way we need to go. Uh, and that's hard, right? It's hard when we talk about it at a church level, and it's hard when we talk about that at an individual level. Because maybe something that works for other people may not work for you. Uh, when we talk about maybe discipleship practices, uh, when we talk about an understanding of, of what we need to do to better our relationship with, with God, um, one of the things that drives me bonkers sometimes is, well, well, I, you know, I've tried it before, so it won't go, it won't work again. Well, you don't know. You don't know until you try. And we, a couple of weeks ago, we, uh, when we were talking about Jesus uh, and Peter's interaction on uh, the water, as, as Peter's walking out on the water, one of the things we talked about was our fear, our fear of failure, right? That, you know, we focus so much on Peter going out into the water. Well, you got 11 other guys sitting in the boat doing nothing. <laughs> they didn't even try. And when we talk about Jesus saying, pick up your cross and follow me. 
the cross is going to be heavy for some. It's going to be hard. The good news is that Jesus takes it with us, right? <laughs> that we don't have to take it alone. And then the second step is to follow. And sometimes that's hard. Mm -hmm. But for me, this, this text, like I said, it, it's, it's so wonderful in its complexity, even just two verses, right? Um, of how we are called to be more focused on the kingdom than what benefits us as individuals and for us as a church, right? Because, uh, and again, and, and forgive me, I, I feel like I'm going off on a tangent, but the human side of us wants to see our church succeed, right? Our churches mm -hmm. succeed, right? We want more, uh, what's, what's the saying? We want more butts in the pews, right? We want to make more money. We want to be able to build new projects. We want to do all these wonderful things and, uh, and promote the church. Well, that's not really what we're trying to do here. What we're actually trying to do is to promote the kingdom. And we have to ask ourselves the question, and then I'm, I'm going to say something spicy, and then I'm going to run away from it. Um, mm. Is We have to ask ourselves the question, if it benefits the kingdom for maybe our church to close, if it benefits the kingdom for us to walk to, to walk away from a ministry, are we going to do it? Mm. Because we want to benefit the kingdom and not ourselves. Just a thought. I think you've said that perfectly as well. Um, so I can give another spicy question and I don't want to spend too much time on this. So, it, we don't have to, but I'm kind of curious what you think as well. Um, so what do you think about with, well, actually, first of all, one thing is y'all are entirely right. I didn't even think about the get behind me Satan thing. Like that should have been like my, my focus for this entire sermon, but I'm just like, Oh yeah, that happened. Oh yeah. So, Oh yeah, that thing happened. Oh, yeah. I feel like John during, uh, during the last supper, he's like, Oh yeah, they had food. Oh yeah, there was there was some food there. I think yeah, yeah. right. But but anyways, um, <laughs> do you think that Peter was kind of on the boat as well as some historical context would suggest that he kind of thought that the kingdom was going to be a physical thing there, and the Messiah was sent to you know rid the Romans out of Jerusalem and give back the Holy Land? For for me, um, I, I ascribe that I I think. Peter was most likely affiliated with the Zealot group, right? Um, which, which is the, as as Brother Sam was just saying, the the desire for a very physical return of the kingdom of Israel, uh, and often and, and often willing to do violent things. You know, Peter, it, it, his actions prove that to me. Um, I'm and not Simon sure. as well. Yeah, the uh, literal Zealot. <laughs> right. But, yeah. So you have you have Peter. Uh, who's also Simon, and then you have uh, Simon the the Zealot. Uh, so I, I do think um, I do think Peter is, or probably was, a Zealot. Yeah. And if you want more information on that, there's a great book in my point of view. It is called Zealot: The Lives and Times of Jesus of Nazareth by Reza Aslam. Um, it's one of my favorite reads, even though he is a apostate from multiple faiths, and he reads it like as a like an atheist, like, I'm going to prove to you that Jesus wasn't real. Like, it actually strengthened my faith. So mm -hmm. just remember that when people try to throw things in your face about Jesus, that sometimes it can actually make you feel stronger about your faith. <laughs> Super good read, though. Sarah, what about you? Do you think Simon was a zealot? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if he was quite in, like, the zealot camp. Um, mm. I, I think there – I don't think there was – a concept at that time necessarily of like a more peaceful way of the kingdom coming about or that Jesus, you know, they, I don't, did they expect that Jesus was going to die and be raised again, even though he like continues to say that and prophesy it. Like, you know, I mean, to me, it seems like when you read the gospels, the disciples don't really get it until it happens. And then they're like, Oh, now I understand <laughs> what you're saying um so yeah i mean i think peter probably was a, a zealot of sorts but i don't know if he was like you know the ones 
like with the people out there and trying to stir up rebellions and stuff like that. Yeah, I don't like know. Barabbas, yeah. 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 And then of course, uh, last thing I promise, um, AD, the story continues, was a continuation of the Bible series History Channel did. That actually explores the zealots a lot if you're interested in watching something instead of reading or listening. So very wonderful um, setup if you haven't watched it. But anyways, I, I know one of us has limited time, so let's go to what she has to do. I wonder, you know, we have uh, been, you know, promoting a lot of like movies and shows. I wonder if we get some sponsors. Oh, maybe that's right. <laughs> sponsored <Sure>. by. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe that's we fun. can get Ben a better camera and microphone. That's true. Yeah, maybe I get sponsored, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> All right, let, let's get moving. Let's good, get moving. good. Uh, Sarah, you you will uh, you've got us for our Romans text. Yes. All right. All right. So today's Romans text is um, Romans chapter twelve, verses nine to twenty-one. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So uh, this text comes after. So last week we looked at the passages before this where Paul is talking about um, there's one body with many members that we are one body in Christ. And now he gives all of these um, imperatives, these instructions of this is what uh, it is. It means to be a Christian. Like if you're a part of this body of Christ, then do these things. Um, and so in some ways, this is lining out for us what what a Christian should do what a Christian should, at least in some ways um, you know he's talked about faith he's talked about receiving grace he's talked about you know we're living by the spirit now not by the law and to me this is outlining what that might look like in a more practical way um, and so I just as I was reading over this um, yeah, I really like that first verse there, verse nine, let love be genuine, hate what is evil, and hold fast to what is good. And to me, it kind of um, is like a, a summary of everything that then he lays out and that all the things that come after that um, kind of fit into those categories in some ways. So he talks about love being genuine. And, and so what does the genuine love look like? Well, he says, you know, loving one another. And the word that he uses there um, for that love one another is the brotherly love, uh, Philadelphia, if you want to go back to the Greek, but brotherly love, loving one another, honoring each other. Um, and part of that is contributing to the needs of others. And, um, and then later in the passage, not being prideful or haughty, um, but being willing, willing to associate with the lowly and being mm -hmm. humble in your wisdom. And that those things, that rejection of pride is a way for us to love others. Um, and, and it also talks about rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. So part of what genuine love looks like is um, being empathetic to what other people are going through, not just being caught up in your own life and the things that you're going through, but being with others, uh, whether it's um, 
going with them in their suffering or celebrating that with them in uh, their rejoicing. And so love genuinely. And then he says, reject evil or hate what is evil. Um, and so in this, I feel like he talks about rejecting evil in, in different ways. So in, in one verse, it says rejoicing in hope, be patient in suffering and persevere in prayer. And to me, those are ways that we reject evil because um, when evil is at work in our lives, sometimes it can be easy to fall into despair. But uh, Paul says, don't be in despair, rejoice in hope uh, when suffering comes. And I feel like suffering, not always, but is often a result of evil in our world. Um, we should be patient through that. And um, endure patience isn't just about like getting through it's about being sustained through uh what we're going through and then persevering in prayer the same kind of idea where you know we do have one of the powers that we have when we face evil in this world is to pray and is to seek god and um and that helps us to be patient in the suffering it helps us to find hope um and so to me those are things that ways that we can hate what is evil, ways that we can resist the evil in our world and um, and to keep from being corrupted by it, um, to keep us from responding with the same kind of evil that was put out there. Um, and so part of what Paul also says here is don't repay evil for evil, um, but leave room for the wrath of God. So, you know, what Paul is instructing Christians and the church to do is uh, respond to others uh, with love, to respond with peace, to respond with blessing to those who curse them and not um, responding with the same evil that's been thrown at them. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's because, uh, you know, that last verse, don't become, over, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Mm -hmm. um, it is so easy for us to be overcome by evil, even like we talked about with Peter, when we're trying to do a good thing, we're trying to do what we think is right. Um, and sometimes we go about it the wrong ways, or we... Um, yeah, just aren't open to maybe what the kingdom is inviting us into. And instead we want to push our own way. Mm. Um, and sometimes we can get burned by that because uh, we fall into the same evil uh, things that other people have perpetrated against us. Um, and so then the last one of that first verse, verse nine, uh, Paul says, hold fast to what is good. Um, and so in this whole little passage where I see Paul highlighting how we choose good, part of that is um, having a zeal, being full of the spirit um, for serving the Lord. And so, you know, we're instead of choosing to be revengeful, instead of choosing to be bitter and angry um, at the evil in our world, we choose good. We choose to be full of of spirit for serving the Lord um, mm -hmm. and not for seeking um, revenge for ourselves. Um, you know, choosing good is blessing those who curse you. It's repaying evil that's been done to you with good mm -hmm. um, and feeding your enemies, giving them something to drink when they're thirsty, uh, being hospitable to strangers, doing what is noble in the sight of all. Um, choosing to live in harmony and to live humbly rather than to lift yourself up or think, you know, talk about yourself as being more wise or, or mm -hmm. better than other people or whatever that might look like. And so, um, you know, as I read this, we, that first verse, loving genuinely, hating what is evil, choosing what is good, um, I think is at least what I focused on as I, I read this and what I felt like Paul was speaking to of what it means to to be a christian and what it means to follow christ and how that looks in our lives um and so final thought on that is just that the goodness there and the evil there um and the love there are things that um paul has in some ways been laying out throughout romans as he talks about 
uh, Christ's work for us, as he talks about God's grace, as he talks about the calling of Israel and the calling of the church. Um, you know, we know what love is because of the grace of Jesus, because of the love that God has shown us. And we know what is evil because God has revealed that to us. Um, and what is the things we should steer away from. And we know what is good because God shows us what is good. And, and we live by the spirit now, which hopefully leads us in how we should act and how we should live um, and into the good things that God desires. Um, and so, you know, we can read this and if we didn't come at it from a Christian perspective, we might just say, yeah, those are nice things. It sounds like a nice way to live, but it's also deeper than that because it's mm -hmm. not just an arbitrary lifestyle of, oh yeah, we think this is a good thing to do, um, developed by our own moral compass, but it's something that is given to us um, in all of these imperative verbs of do this and don't do this and, and live this way. Um, you know, it's given to us as this divine revelation and a moral guide that's um, outside of ourselves. Um, and so in some ways that's counter to at least some segments of our culture today that mm -hmm. um, seek to find morality from within our, our own um, experience. So if, if I may be the first one to jump in, cause I'm like chomping at the bit here. I first want to say, I don't know how it happened, but why this scripture isn't the love chapter um, really grinds my gears, right? Like, <laughs> or, you know, first Corinthians 13. Woo. Yeah. That's the, you know, the fancy, you know, everyone gets married to that, to that scripture, which fun fact, do, do all of clergy around the world a favor. Please don't use the first Corinthians 13 text, you know, unless it really identifies, you know, for, for you and for your family, uh, mix it up. We like to, we like to mix it up. Don't we? Right. I can't be the only one. Um, but, um, I love this. I love this scripture. Um, one, because, uh, and I'm going to throw Sarah under the bus a little bit. Um, <laughs> Sarah and I, we went to uh, Eastern Mennonite Seminary. Uh, I went there for a little while uh, before I, I moved up here to New York, but Alyssa finished her, her seminary. Uh, <laughs> Sarah finished her, uh, her seminary education uh, at Eastern Mennonite. Uh, and the big person that she talked about at Eastern Mennonite was always Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Like, mm. That right, right. So it was that sometimes like you get Bonhoeffered out, right? Um, and um, I, I bring that up because um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer speaks to this text really well, uh, especially towards the end, as we're talking about uh, repay, don't repay evil with evil, but with good. Um, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer's really um, claim to fame was his response. Um, to the Nazi Reich um, prior uh, to World War II uh, and his importance of speaking out against injustice. So we want to make it very clear um, that not repaying evil for evil isn't to, what doesn't mean is have a blind eye, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, saying hear no evil, see no evil, right? It's not that. Uh, it also does not necessarily mean, especially for Bonhoeffer's case, um, in, in terms of using how he responded to the Nazi Reich, wasn't that, hey, I don't need to go give every Nazi that I see, you know, a high five and a cake, you know, uh, to approve and give them love. For him, his response to the Apostle Paul, especially in this scripture, was to go out and especially advocate for the Jewish population, for the Mennonite population, for all of those who were um, attacked and harassed uh, and killed by the Nazi Reich, his response of, of repaying evil with good was an emboldened uh, response of good, so much so that Beowulf agrees. Uh, so I'm actually going to pass the buck to Sam while, while he does this. That's all good. <laughs> Perfect. So um, what I was going to say is thankfully – a good brother went first because that's way more than I was going to say. And I do love Bonhoeffer as well. So that was a fantastic addition. But the things that really get to me is in this chapter in particular, I, I kind of imagine Romans like an airplane, right? And um, Paul is finally off of the ground of his own content 
and is finally putting a whole bunch of quotations in there, if you haven't noticed. Yeah. So there's a ton of scripture references. Anytime Paul puts something in quotations, go back and figure out what he's talking about. He is all over the place in this text, and I think that's a fantastic thing to remember. Um, my only major thing I would add, just because I think it's funny, is um, verse uh, 20, right? He's like, so it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No. And then he adds to it. I just, I love that part. And it's just the humanity of Paul that speaks, you know, 2,000 years later that I think that we kind of forget as we read the Bible. Yes, it is, in, it is the inspired word of God and it is the spirit of God. It is a living text, but we forget it was written by real people. Mm. And you can see that kind of come out, like especially with, um, with these texts, when you get to the Peters with the Peter, Pastor Peter Publishing Party, when you get to um, Ezra and Nehemiah, like you get in like all of the self commentaries, like Ezekiel, um, Jeremiah, you get all of these, uh, these little snippets of who that person was as they're sitting there writing this down, their own account. It's like if somebody picked up, you know, our journals today or looked at our, I guess, meme stashes would be the best way I could describe <laughs> it, right? Like what kind of memes does this guy have? And it could, it could paint this picture that someone could read, you know, hundreds of years later and be like, oh, snap, that guy was actually kind of cool. Or, oh, man, I used to stay away from that. But I, I, it's just a little aside that doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Uh, thanks be to God for memes. Uh, no, Praise <laughs> be to memes. So, uh, no, thank you. And, and thank you, Sam, for picking that up while uh, Beowulf and Serafina were, were howling. Uh, so uh, it, it's always fun in the Laka household. Yeah, had a little air raid, it sounded like, over there. Speaking yeah, of yeah, World War II. Like. Yeah, uh, we live right next to the firehouse. Uh, so mm -hmm. that was the firehouse uh, we're spotting. And we give thanks to God for them. But uh, it always gives uh, my two howlers a wonderful opportunity to howl. Uh, but it is, uh, you know, I wanted to finish my thought, uh, you know, of responding of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, right? That uh, as the Apostle Paul uh, says in verse uh, 10 and 11, right? And, I, and I, this is really what, what influenced Bonhoeffer and, and for me as a, as a Wesleyan, um, you know, helps encourage me, right? So uh, love one another with mutual love. And then I love this, the second part, outdo one another mm. in showing uh, honor. And pick up in verse 11, do not lag in zeal, but be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord, right? Get off your butt, <laughs> right? There's that word again. Right. Do it, right? You know, be able uh, to not just be someone who says, yes, I believe in Jesus. Mm. Uh, and, and I can't wait till, you know, uh, till I get to hang out in glory and everything's going to be great. Um, but for us as disciples of Christ, there is work to be done, right? And, and Brother Sam, uh, you know, said, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's like uh, repeating, you know, a, a broken record. That, that's, that's for me. That's my broken record, right? Is like, hey, there is work to be done. Uh, there is work to be done for, for us here in, in the kingdom. Uh, it, is not, it is not enough, it is not enough to get out of our hell, uh, get out of hell for free card, right? It, it, that, that's not enough. Uh, what Jesus uh, is inviting us into is to respond to the kingdom. Mm. Uh, and, and the Exodus text really, uh, you know, for me speaks to that. So we'll get to that in a second, but speaking of that, yeah. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, and be encouraged that when we talk about, how do we respond with evil, right? Because I think that's a prominent question that as pastors we get faced with, right? Is how do we respond with, I mean, like real uh, profound evil that, that sometimes, you know, keeps us, you know, awake at night. Um, the Apostle Paul addresses it, right? It talks about this is how we respond to evil. And it's a difficult way to respond to it, isn't it, right? Um, it's not, it goes against how I've often said, it goes against our human uh, nature, doesn't it, right? Our human nature is to fight back, is, is to, um, what's the, oh man, I'm blinking out in the historical uh, verbiage here, um, but uh, it was during the Cold War of this guaranteed mutual destruction, right? The, uh, Assur mutual assured destruction. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I, knew, I knew if I just got enough of it, Sam would be able to help me out. Thank you, Sam. Mad. <laughs> uh, 
right? Where this is, if you respond, right? If you do something to me, I am going to bring it up to 10, right? And then knowing that if you bring it up to 10, I'm going to bring it up to 20. Um, that's often how we respond to each other. And that's not the calling in which God has given to us. Um, mm. so thank you, Sarah, for, um, for lifting up and, uh, uh, thank you for enduring a Bonhoeffer conversation with me. I know it wasn't as intense as, as we used to do in the Eastern Mennonite, but uh, uh, I had to do it, right? It's just, it's ingrained in us. A little bit. That is pretty Mennonite of them, isn't it? To like it, Bonhoeffer. It, Sarah, I cannot think of a class that we had that didn't assign at least one Bonhoeffer book with that class. Oh, really? Yeah. It was just yeah, like, I, I mean, had a few that didn't. Did you? Did you? Yeah. You could, I, I, you could pick a worse theologian. I mean, I, lo I love Bonhoeffer, right? You know, um, I disagree with him in some, some aspects, but there's a lot of Bonhoeffer that I just, like, adore. Um, and, I like his little glasses. Uh, he, 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 his he little was, round glasses. He's a good-looking man for back in the... <laughs> in the a handsome man for the 40s. Well, a handsome man for the 40s, yeah. All right, with that being said, talking about another handsome man, we're going to talk about Moses now. So before we do that, since um, our sister Sarah has limited time, um, yes. do you have any announcements for your church? I don't think so. Things are pretty much staying the same this week, and yeah. All right, praise be. So um, first of all, thank you for joining us today, as always. And uh, whenever you're ready to dip out, please go ahead. All right. There we go. Don't do a long reading scripture. No, I'm scared. Uh, <laughs> are you going to read the whole thing or are you just going to pick up? I'm going to read the section? whole thing because I can do it fast. Whoa! Yeah. Ready to watch. All right, ready to go. Uh, Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Ready to go. Whoa! Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Hebron, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and bring them out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezzarites, the Hivites, and the Jeb Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me, and I have seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, and I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign that you, uh, oh, excuse me, this is the sign for you that is that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your Israelites has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, hold on, oh Lord, you shall say that there's a ringing noise that I can't get rid of right now. Uh oh, I'm going to finish reading the scripture and then I'm going to be fine. Myself. Keep going, keep going. Uh, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I, I am has sent you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. The word of God for you, me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, that could have just been the choir of angels uh, singing. Uh, yeah, and you, and you sent him a voicemail. And I sent him, <laughs> I sent him the, the voicemail. Uh, forgive me, this uh, joys of technology, amen. Um, 
Sarah, before I guess I go, do you have anything to, I know that we want to honor your time as, as well. Uh, what, what spoke to you uh, in, in this text? Um, yeah, so something I think because I talked about it a little bit at a Bible study last week with my church. Um, and that is, you know, the name for God there. I am who I am. Um, and just to me, you know, we think about the pre-existence of God and, um, you know, how God relates to creation, um, thinking about that name for God, I am who I am, or just like God is, um, to me is really helpful as we think about, uh, you know, where did everything come from? And, you know, there had to be something that created everything um, and that something was God. And uh, mm. to me, that name for God just speaks of that, that God just is, God is uncreated. God is there and, and here and everywhere. And, and uh, everything has come from God. So. Amen. There, there's also another fun fact uh, uh, about that um, uh, from, from the gospel of Mark too, but I'll, I'll get to that in just, just a moment. Uh, yeah, so, so last week we talked about uh, Moses' birth, right? So we kind of fast-tracked a little bit through Moses' birth. Um, and we're, we're kind of also skipping another important part uh, of the story of Moses. Um, again, if you haven't watched the Prince of Egypt movie, go do that. Uh, it's a great we'll be here. Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll be here. Pause us. Go watch that movie. It's, it's a great movie. Um, but uh, that being said, uh, Moses kills an Egyptian. Uh, he kills an Egyptian. Um, this time in scripture, he does it on purpose. Uh, spoiler alert, in the, uh, in the movie, he does it by accident. So a little bit of discrepancy, but uh, that's movies for you. So um, then once he finds out that other people know that he did this, uh, he runs away. Uh, and he runs away uh, to this region of Midian where he finds uh, this uh, wonderful woman uh, whose name I always struggle pronouncing um, it is uh, Zipporah, Zipporah, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, Zipporah. Zipporah. Um, and he rescues her and some others from um, some bandits who are har harassing her. And he gets to marry her uh, and has uh, a wonderful child um, who the Hebrew name is really fun um, to say, uh, which is uh, Gershon, or Gershon um, which means alien. Um, and more, more specifically, it means foreigner, right? Someone who is not from that place. Um, and he was being a little prophetic in his own life. Um, so just imagine, if you're ever frustrated with your own name, uh, thanks be to God, you're, you're not uh, Gershom uh, or Hosea's uh, children, uh, who literally means uh, not my child, uh, Loamashi, if I remember correctly the, in the Hebrew. Uh, so... Uh, Thanks be to God that we don't do that too much uh, anymore, right? Um, but to pick up with our scripture for today, we see Moses uh, having this really divine experience that for many of us, we're familiar with, right? This is a pretty prominent um, Sunday school lesson, right? Where uh, Moses and the, bur the burning bush. But for me, there's a couple of really wonderful um, theological points to happen. Um, First, Moses sees this burning bush, and it doesn't initially speak to him. Uh, he just sees that it's burning, and, uh, and it should wither away as anything that is set on fire. It should crumble in itself. So it isn't necessarily what often people think that this mystical burning thing and, in which the, the word of the Lord is speaking to initially, it was just something that piqued his interest right, of what, what is this? This is really weird. This shouldn't be this way. And because of that, he responded to it, right? So God had sent this angel to do something miraculous in this bush to get Moses's attention. And I couldn't help but think uh, as I was, uh, you know, preparing for, for this week doing this, I wonder what, what God is doing in our lives, right? Uh, to pique our interest, to get our attention and saying, what is the burning bush in our life. Now, I know for many of us that we would much prefer to, you know, walk outside and see a burning bush and have a, a great conversation with the Lord, because that would just make things easier. Amen, right? Like that would just uh, be, uh, you know, preferred. 
but that's not the case for us. But God is still speaking and doing and moving things. So what is it in our life, uh, in our lives that, that God is piquing our interest so that God can speak to us? The second part is acknowledging, Moses acknowledging um, the holiness of this sacred space. Um, for some ministers, um, that's why they won't wear shoes in, that, in the pulpit area. I don't know if, if you all have experienced that or seen that. Um, do you do that, Sam? Yeah, do you? Mm, I do that. Yeah. Um, some ministers do it, some, some don't. Um, I have really stinky feet, so... Uh, Me too. Would, people would probably faint in the front row, oh, you know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, this, this understanding that, understanding the reverence of this place so again, Moses is responding after uh, God speaks to him. He's going, wow, okay, wait, this is holy. This is special. So Moses is getting in his mind, prepared to receive something from the Holy One. And again, it helped me thought of what do we do in our lives, right, to prepare to receive something from God? Right. For Moses, again, it was going and responding to something that was interesting and then taking off his sandals, um, which is um, an interesting task because now he's bare. Right now. Now the, the protection on his feet is gone. Um, and I don't know if you've ever you know, stepped on a Lego or a rock with your bare feet. It's not fun. <laughs> and yet Moses was willing to be able to do this to prepare to hear something. From the Holy One. So then God reminds uh, Moses that he has heard uh, what is happening to uh, his, his people, the Israelites in Egypt. And this verbiage is interesting. Um, this is uh, in verse 7. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry in the account of their taskmasters. Uh, this is, is God... Um, not forgetting, so this is an important, right? Because um, in the end of chapter two, God uses some interesting verbiage uh, that is r rather, uh, God it remembers the cries of his people. And, mm -hmm. and, and the remembering isn't that God has forgotten, right? Has forgotten who the Israelites are. It is to remember the covenant. So when God announces himself, to Moses, he is, I am the God of Abraham, of Joseph, and Isaac. All people who he has continued the covenant with. Uh, so as he's reminding Moses, hey, I'm, I've been in this in the long haul. I'm with you. Uh, and this is really uh, important. Uh, so then he goes on and says, I'm going to deliver them. I'm, I'm going to let you in on the plan. And guess what, Moses? You're part of it. You're going to take the people out of Egypt through what I have done through you. Uh, and this is a, a really neat conversation that continues on. Um, sometimes uh, I get upset when the lectionary just kind of cuts it off. I wish it, it would have finished uh, all of chapter, chapter three. But uh, Moses uh, kind of asks a lot of questions, right? He, he's not a very typical um, how the prophets would respond, right? Most of the prophets will, will use that verbiage, here I am, Lord, and then um, maybe say one thing that they're, right, I'm, I'm not qualified, but then they go in, all in. Moses tries to get out, right? He asks a lot of questions, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in committee meetings long <laughs> enough when we just ask enough questions that we just, you know, put it in, into the dirt. And uh, so Moses is, is asking a lot of questions here. Uh, and to get to, to Sarah's point uh, in verse uh, 13, it says, uh, when I go to the Israelites, and, and it's interesting because Moses is an Israelite, but he is referring them more to as God's people, not his own people. Uh, and that changes. And we'll see um, for the next 10 weeks, we're going to be uh, focusing on Moses. Uh, that's what the lectionary text talks about. So you're going to see how Moses talks about the Israelites, it changes uh, a couple of times. And it's really fun to, to acknowledge that and see that. Um, but he goes and says, what should I say? Or who should I say uh, is, is doing the sending? Uh, and as Sarah pointed out, um, God responds, say, I am who I am. In Hebrew, it is ego ami. 
And if you can jump with me to the Gospel of Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark chapter 14. And I don't like to, I, I often try to stay in text, but this is too good not to, uh, to jump. Spicy. To it's, it's, too, it's too good. And I love it. So the Gospel of Mark chapter 14, uh, and I'm going to read verses uh, 61 and 62 very briefly. Uh, but, but he was silent and did not answer. And again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Verse 62, Jesus said, I am. And you will see that the son of man is seated at the right hand of power and is coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, why do we still need witnesses? You have heard this blasphemy, right? So yeah, the priest just rips off his clothes, right? And um, it seems like an overreaction, right? Uh, like, wow, that's, you asked him a question and he responded uh, the way that you wanted him to. Uh, <laughs> so why did you rip off your clothes? Ah! Like, ah, right? Uh, if you ever get mad in a conversation, uh, just rip off your clothes. Uh, it'll be a proof that you are uh, rightfully upset. Uh, the reason something. why this priest did this uh, is because um, Jesus uses this Hebrew word. He responds to the question, are you the Messiah? He responds by saying, ego me. I am who I am. Which is this divine name for God that Moses was given to. So the blasphemy that this priest heard uh, and all of those who, would, who were there heard that Jesus just referred to himself as God, as the, the divine God who showed up to Moses, who was quite revered uh, at the time and still is revered in the Jewish tradition. So this name is really, really important. Uh, and, and Sarah said it so beautifully and wonderfully that it also uh, transcends time, right? Uh, God is, hey, I am who I am. Uh, and for me, uh, as an Old Testament preacher, it also is an indication of what's going to happen for the rest of the Old Testament. Mm. God is constantly revealing God's self. So I am not just uh, Elohim. I am not just El Shaddai. I am not just, just these aspects uh, of, of God that just has one name. I'm going to continue to reveal myself and show you that I am all things, that I am who I am. Uh, and it's a really beautiful and wonderful uh, theological statement. Uh, and, and then God um, continues to have this wonderful conversation. So with before, before you move, my, bro my dear brother, can I add one thing to that? Yes. Yeah, um, so Get me out of my... my cool. Background. I'm actually going to push this back in for one second and pull us yeah. back out. So um, that divine name you're talking about, that is different than the reason why Lord throughout the Old Testament is spelled in a different font in most Bibles. That is a complete. That is a different thing, if I'm not mistaken. Correct? Because that would be the tetragrammaton. Versus... So that's Yahweh. Yeah. So Yahweh yes. and and Ego Ami are are different. Yeah. Correct. So that's it. That is the name of God. I am who I am. But whenever you see Lord in a, a weird font in the Old Testament, they're mm -hmm. using an acronym for the name of God. Right. Which is and Yahweh. We, yeah. Yeah. Y H W H. But, yeah. yeah. And, and and yes. So yeah. Let me explain that a little bit further. Thank you for bringing that up. So. Um, Yahweh is both name and title, right? Um, but this ego ami is, is uh, and actually for some of you will, uh, in your Bibles might say the, the divine name revealed. Uh, it is God revealing God's, uh, like a personal name, right? So uh, there's that formal name, right? So this is, uh, you know, Pastor Bailey, right? Uh, that's formal, right? That, that's, and it's a very, so, um, but I'm sure uh, Sarah will, say, will call me Sarah, right? Uh, that's your personal name. So God has revealed this very personal aspect, uh, mm. which is the ego of me. So Yahweh is still good, uh, but you'll never, the only other time, uh, and, and I'm going to go on a land, the only other time in scripture that you'll see ego of me is in that Mark 62 text. Uh, which, uh, again, because Yahweh was this both name and title, where Egomi was this personal name uh, that mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't call God. Um, it was kind of, and that's why even still when you talk about Yahweh, they don't fully spell it out because 
uh, it was it was bad. He was embarrassed. That's a whole other discussion in itself. That's a whole other discussion. Yeah, uh, but no, thank you. It is an important distinction um, to to make the difference. So, and that, again, another reason why the priest freaked out uh, the way that he did uh, is because not only did he just he didn't call himself Yahweh, right? He called himself Ebu uh, which is which is a big deal. Um, what else do you? Have? I, I could I could talk to the, about this for for forever. Um, so what, Sam? What else do you do you have, Sarah? If you have anything else, I'll let Sarah go. I mean, I I shared pretty much what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. um, we'll uh, I'm, I'm very similar to you, Ben. I could keep going on this all day. I'm not. <laughs> I I want to, but I also want to be respectful of time because we are already over an hour. Yeah. So I want to be super respectful about that. What I love about this text, as you'll recall through our scriptures the past couple of weeks, is um, verses 7 and 8 and 9. Um, God explaining what's going to happen. He's like, you know, I've heard the cries of my people, and we are here to deliver them. And I will show them their new land. And he names all these people that you might be familiar with, especially two weeks ago. And the New Testament, through the gospel reading, the Canaanites, hmm, kind of like the Canaanite woman we talked about. <laughs> and then you've got the Hittites, the Amorites, the Prezites, the, Hitt or the Hivites, and the Jebusites. You have all these different people that show up in the biblical story. And it's just a super neat weaving in of this promise that was said back in the first book, Genesis, mm. that the readers and the, I guess at this point, it would be the listeners of the time, mm. because these books were traditionally oral until Moses traditionally wrote them down. And then, yeah, I just like this promise of this continuation that, you know, God saying, hey, I haven't forgotten that promise. And he's, that's what our God is. He is ever loving, ever steadfast. When God makes a promise, it's never over until he says it's over. And we're very blessed that he has not said it's over for us. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. Um, well, that being said, well, we didn't get to our psalm text, but please make sure that you uh, have an opportunity to, to read that. It is super cool. It is super, super neat. Uh, Sam, do you have any announcements for, for your church? Uh, guess what, y'all? Uh, we got our charge conference day. So if you're a leader, you'll be getting paperwork. If you're on a committee, we will find some way to safely have a meeting together, whichever you're most comfortable with. Even if we have to sit outside and masks 20 feet away with loudspeakers, we will have a meeting together to figure our stuff out before October. Um, another thing, homecoming is in two weeks. I have no idea what that looks like. Our guest speakers are not able to join us. We cannot have our, mu our music inside or outside. So we, we obviously can't have a potluck. So we don't know what this looks like yet. If you have any ideas, please get in touch with me, get in touch with our lay leaders, and we will figure this out together. Amen. I will say the most difficult part of, of, of COVID as a United Methodist is not being able to have potlucks. As, um, My waist is very happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Victor, friends, uh, we are still uh, working through our mission statement together. So um, you'll see an announcement uh, with, with some links to go to. We want to encourage you to do that uh, so that we can continue to discuss uh, our mission statement together. So we want to invite you uh, along with that process. Uh, that's all uh, that we have for right now. Um, so with that being said, Brother Sam, can you uh, lead us out in some prayer, please? I would be honored. Holy Lord and Almighty King, creator of all things that we see and the glimpses of what we will see to come. We just thank you for this glorious day you have given us, this opportunity to sit down just in holy fellowship and share in your gracious word. Allow us to remember your promises that you've made for us all, that you will not leave us nor forsake us. You have created us and we are fearfully and wonderfully made in this world, Father. Remind us that we are not of this world any longer. We are aliens, as we have said, Father. We have, been, we have conquered sin and death. Let us remember in our journeys that there is no power greater than you. Allow us to have boldness as we go forth and proclaim your glorious and great name, but allow us as well to have your patience and your peace. Allow us to rest well on this blessed day and to continue to be the cities on the hill that you have called us all to be. Amen. Amen. Friends, thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you again next week. Until then, may God bless and keep you. Amen. See you all soon. Bye.